they on time. They know exactly, you know, they know exactly how to cut stuff out, you know, to protect the innocent. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, let's grab your Bibles this morning, and we're going to declare uh, this morning how we're going to receive the word. God's great, isn't he? Huh? I see you in everything all day. Say, this is my Bible. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, this is my Bible. It is God's holy word. Jesus said that it's spirit and it is life. Therefore, I cannot receive this word with my natural mind, my carnal intellect. Jesus, sow this word into my spirit. I shall and I will receive it. You can see, I was seeing the presence of the Lord. I want to remind you, it's been a while since I have, but I want uh, to remind you all um, that um, there are four things that you need to uh, uh, grab hold to to come into any uh, piece of, um, of, of revelation. Number one, I mean, uh, of understanding of anything you're trying to study. Number one is a revelation. Somebody shout revelation. You got to get a revelation. In, in, in order to, to accomplish the things of God, in order uh, to come to some understanding of, of whatever it is that you're studying, I don't care if it's calculus, I don't care uh, if it's trig, I don't care if it's history, I don't care if it's political science, I don't care if it's the word of God. You first have got to get a revelation. Uh huh. Revelation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and number two, I think it's important that everyone uh, can find a role model. Somebody shout role model. Listen, I think we, we, we suffer when we don't have patterns and people that, you know, can I, can I give you an example of a role model? When I grew up coming up in the 60s and coming up in the 70s, uh, do you know we thought forever that the one uh, mile uh, record would never be broken? Huh? We, we said nobody's going to be able to do that. Nobody's going to be able to break the mile record. At the time, I think it was four or something. I'm not sure what it was, but it was really low. It was really, y'all remember that? Oh, it was like it was there forever. It was there forever. Now you got guys running marathons would take down one of the, take down that old record inside of a 26-mile marathon. Somebody shout role model. One person does it. Now everybody's breaking the record. You understand what I'm saying? That record stood forever until one person. Somebody say the power of one. And when you can get a role model, somebody who's done it, somebody who's uh, laid it out. It makes a difference. Amen. Uh, next, after that, you got to have uh, a regiment of faith. I think if you don't have a regiment of faith, you know, you can never accomplish or understand what it is you're trying to do. I don't care if it's on your job. You got to have a regiment of faith. I don't care if it's on a basketball court, some kind of sporting thing. You got to have faith in your ability, faith that you can accomplish and over overcome an obstacle, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you don't believe it, you, you're not going to ever achieve it. And lastly, you got to have what I call determination or a righteous resolve. If you don't have resolve, if you don't say, man, the tenacity to say, you know what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get it done, you will never learn it. I think uh, that in itself is a sermon by itself. If you understand those four things, you'll always come into an understanding. I want to bring that into our teaching today. We're going to talk about, we've been talking about this is the year of supernatural restoration. We're talking about uh, supernatural restoration. We talked about the restoration of, of hope, the restoration of glory. Uh, we talked about the financial restoration and all kind of other things, but uh, we want to talk today about the restoring your lost or wasted years. Restoring wasted years. I want to turn to the book of Joel. Now, if you read on your own, if you could, just read the book of Joel, Joel 1 and 2. And it, Joel's a short book anyway. You can read it. You'll, you'll, you'll enjoy the reading. But it would make this teaching 
uh, even more understandable for you. But Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, and Joel chapter number uh, 2 and verse 25, it says, and I will restore to you the years, uh, the Bible said, that the locusts have eaten, hmm? the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. How many years did you waste before you repented and surrendered it all to Jesus? How many years <clears throat> of your life were eaten up by the canker worm of sin and rebellion? You know, you know that you're forgiven from your past. You know you're forgiven from your past, and your past is forgotten because it's under the blood of Jesus. We, we, we get that, right? But wouldn't you love to get back the time and the years of life for the glory of God? I think we all think about that sometimes. You know, I know we want to look forward, but sometimes we get caught thinking, how stupid was I? How blind was I? How often have you thought, I could have been much farther as a Christian. You know, some people say, you know, Bishop, I wish I had met you a long time ago. But the problem becomes you wasn't ready a long time ago. Hmm? We say to, you know, those of us who have been married, you know, multiple decades, say, if I only met you, even 20 years earlier. No, 20 years earlier, your behind wasn't ready. <laughs> no, you wasn't ready for the blessing you sit next to. That's just going to be honest. God has some uprooting and some stuff to get up out of you first. You say to yourself, I could have brought so much joy to God's heart. I could have saved myself and my family so much pain and suffering had I, <sighs> how blind and stupid was I? Come on, we've had these conversations. How close I came to losing every single thing, my soul, my, my, even my mind, you know? And I can never make up those wasted years. Watch this now. In the final days of Paul, the Apostle Paul's life, the Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. He said, I have kept the faith. And then he says, now a crown of righteousness is awaiting me. You know, there's so many times that I think about the mistakes I've made, the missed opportunities to let my light shine uh, because my flesh got in the way. Missed opportunities because anger, missed opportunities because arrogance or whatever, pride. I just blew it. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about that so you could have got saved if you had chose the other way to handle it? In fact, the closer you get to the heart of God, the closer you get to the heart of Jesus, the more those wasted years grieve you, the more it hurts you to say, God, you trusted me, but I, I didn't measure up. The more you fall in love with Christ, the more you love him, the more you cry out to him. How could I have hurt you like this? How could I have done it? 
How can I have been so deceived is, is, is the real question. You know, how did I let these years go by being so deceived? You know, some people are, are willfully want to stay ignorant. It took years that, really, I took years that really belonged to you, God. They wasn't my years. They were your years. Your word is so precious to me now. When I make a mistake, I can tell it right away. I know that I willfully did something. It hurts hard. I think about the growth in Christ that I squandered. I think about the loss, the revelation that I lost. I think about the blessings and the anointing that I forfeited. And I forfeited the transfer of that anointing to others. How many people did I fail to bless? When you start thinking about the weighty matter of time, it didn't make any difference if you've been saved 30 years or three years. I got good news this morning. God can and will restore your wasted years. I'm going to say it again. God can and he will restore your wasted years. This one prophecy of Joel was directed to three groups. The nation of Israel, the church, and individuals in Christ's body. I want to focus on the third group. I want to fo focus on individual believers this morning as it relates to this loss and wasted years. You were once being devoured by an army of evil spirits who moved in upon you and consumed everything you had. Joel likened these spirits, as the text said, to the destruction of locusts, palmer worms, caterpillars, canker worms. These insects are known devourers. Devouring everything good and decent. Look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 11. He speaks of a great army of God. There he speaks of this great army strong that executes his word. He says, and the Lord shall, utterly, shall, shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? The entire chapter has been grossly misinterpreted as being a godly army. It's not a godly army. He's sending an army of destruction. When you go back and look at the text, there are songs that are sung, but that's not the army of the Lord to help you. This is the army to destroy Israel. It is, the, it is the Lord's army, but only because he calls it forth as his rod to execute his wrath. That's what the text says. It's a rod that executes his wrath. Joel says of this demonic army in Joel 2 and verse 1, he says, sound the alarm in Zion, warn them, warn God's people. Hmm? He said, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. He warns God's people that the army is coming to bring darkness and destruction. You can't get, get, get that confused right there. Here's a picture of an un, un, unrepentant people 
upon whom the enemy came in like a flood. They, they were without defense. Hmm? Evil spirits raged like flames and burned everything in its sight. Unrepentant sinners cringed. Their faces were full of sorrow. The evil locusts are the men of war. Climbing over every human wall of resistance entering through every window of the mind and the heart and nothing can, can destroy them. The sinner has no sword and he and, and he's really has no, no fight to put up against him at all. These destructive spirits, these evil spirits are well governed, and they march on without even breaking rank. And no matter how many times the sinner tries to resist, the army keeps coming. You know, if you was ever once bound by any satanic habit or some kind of addiction or whatever, You know this. You know what it's like. Your home once like a garden filled with peace and love. Soon it's devoured like a desert. I've seen families that one minute everything is good, and the next minute all hell is breaking loose. One minute you go back over. That's why Wanda and I, try to get couples from time to time to go back over and look at your wedding pictures. I don't care how formal they are, but if you look at those wedding pictures, it will bring you back if you allow it to your mind to say how beautiful she was, huh? how great he was, and how blessed I am that she get, he getting ready to take me out of my mama's house. I'm getting ready to leave this place. I'm going off to a new life. You felt safe. You felt excited. And now you can't even stand to look at each other. That means the locust is working. Oh, come on now. Somebody need, somebody need to say something right there. You try to stop the attacks, but like powerful horsemen, they leap on you. <laughs> And they're too strong to resist. You can't do nothing. One minute it was blissed. Then all of a sudden here, you don't know what's happening. Agape, one satanic worm after another is devouring the life of the saints. Joel 1 and 4, that which the palmer worm have left. Half the locust eat, and that which <laughs> the locust have left, <laughs> the canker worm eateth, and that which the canker worm left, the cow. Have you ever seen one piece of hell after the next? Soon as you you think it's over, here comes another wave. I mean, there's nothing else. This this is already over. There's nothing else here, and they keep coming and devouring. Every crack valve, every joint, every bag of coke, every heroin needle, hmm? every little bit of fentanyl. Lustful looks. They're just like locusts and canker worms. It keeps coming and coming. And come. When you think you got it, it comes again. Isn't that what happened? Isn't that how it happens? It seems like I, 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 I think I got it, and then next thing you know, I'm back to the space where I was. In Joel 1 and 6, Satan had his teeth clamped on you. 
the Bible says, whose teeth are the teeth of lions. Teeth, the Bible says, in the, in the B part of that, at the end, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He causes waste, ruin, and mourning. The field is wasted. The land mourns. For the corn is wasted. Things are gone. Everything in your life is withered away. Joel goes on to talk about in 10 and 12, I don't want you to put that up. He says the vine is dried up and the fig tree languishes. Even all the trees of the field are withered. Joy is withered away. When you get to the place where you just want to throw up both hands and holler. It seems like no matter what you do, it's always something. When you seem like you done your best, you did everything you know to do. And I think one of the cautions, one thing I want to caution you about, me and the wife were talking about this. Don't tell me how good you are in the midst of your trouble. Well, I did everything God told me to do, and I did. All. You ain't read the book of Job? You not read Job? Job didn't come up to God and talk about how perfect and upright he was. God said he was perfect and upright. Huh? He didn't, he, he, he didn't say, I'm perfect and upright. Why did all this happen to me? Why not you? Joel is describing the terrible scene from this devouring army and what this army has done and the evil work. And when you look into the face of a drug addict or you look into the face of somebody that's dying of a terrible death, if you haven't done that, you see the same kind of terrible destruction. When there is no hope, you can see that the person knows that they're going to die. There's no way out. I need for you to do something. I want you to think back to your time of deliverance. You were dying both spiritually and you were dying physically. Totally helpless. And it seemed like the hordes of hell just continued to overpower you. Joel 22 and 25 says, I will restore to you the years <laughs> that the locusts have eaten. Glory to God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The New Standard Version says this, I will make up to you for the years eaten. God said, I I'm going to make up to you. This promise, my friends, is incredible. This is an incredible promise that God lays out to us. I hope you're with me this morning. All along, I wanted to make up those years to God, to make amends and to repay him. But he says, wrong. I will make it up to you, he says. Did y'all get that? How many times have you said, God, I know I messed up, but I'm going to give you everything and I'm going to make it up to you. No, 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 no. God said, no. God said wrong, wrong. He says, I will make it up to you. All those years of being wasted, stripped, and harassed by the devil. He said, you can't repay me. Not for one single wasted hour can you repay me. Hmm? Look at Joel 2, 2, 2 and 21. He says, fear not. Basically, he says, be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do a great things. He said, the Lord will do great things. In, in, in 19, 20, 26, and 27, I don't want you to go there, but I want you to write it down. Joel 2, 19 
through 20, 26 and 27, here's what it basically says. You need not be ashamed of your wasted years. God is going to remove from you the evil army. You're not going to do it. Somebody shout, God's going to do it. And you will eat and be satisfied. You will never be ashamed again. You were born for an eternal purpose. You, you were born for an eternal purpose. And, 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 and God knows that purpose. You soon should know your eternal purpose. He planned for you a life of satisfaction and useful life in the kingdom of God. But then sin comes in. Hmm? And God's plan for your life is interrupted. The devourer, the locust, the caterpillar, the canker worm, the devourer moves in. And suddenly years are wasted, wasted in divorce, hmm? wasted in bankruptcy, hmm? wasted in a whole bunch of ways. But now, glory to God, (laughs) in Christ, all things are new. Y'all didn't hear me. I said, in Christ, all things are new. Even the calendar is new. Even the calendar is new. The Lord goes back to the day that the locust came. (laughs) My God, he removes all those wasted years. And starts counting again from the moment you repent. Somebody shout repent. Somebody shout God forgive me. All those blessings you miss. Saints of God were stored up. (laughs) All the joy, all the peace, the revelation, the usefulness that you thought was dead. And you thought it was gone forever. Actually was kept aside by God himself. You know, I can imagine in hell, the damned are going to be haunted with visions of their life of what it could have been. Some may see what they lost. But this is not so for those of us who are repentant. Somebody shout repent. I said you better shout repent. Everything will be restored. They will never say again, oh, what I missed. No, you didn't miss nothing. You didn't miss anything. We beat ourselves up. Because we don't see the power and the awesomeness of God. We talk about what we could have been. Do you know that's the worst conversation you can hear when you're hanging around with guys or friends and you talk to them. And you know what's amazing? Uh, some Some of the most hurtful conversations and painful conversations is when you get old enough. This year was my 50th, is that right? Yeah, I guess it was. I graduated from high school in 1972. That's 50 years. I made a mistake of taking my wife to the 40th. That's why we didn't go to the 50th. (laughs) My wife was just meddling, like, Who's that? One of your teachers? I said, what are you talking about? That lady right there. I said, no, it's my classmate. Boy, these folks look old around here. <laughs> I was not going to take her to 50. <laughs> 50 years. 
and to go back and listen to people and their if I woulda, coulda speeches. If I done this or if I did that. If this and if that. My late mother used to say, if ifs and nuts, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, he said, we'll all have a Merry Christmas. We sit around talking about what if I could or should or would or no. In God, you don't have to do that. Do you understand what I'm talking about? God commanded a Sabbath year. You remember in the scriptures in Leviticus, he, 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 he commanded a Sabbath year. That would be the seventh, every seventh year in Israel. And the people were to allow the ground to rest on the seventh year. But they wondered what they were going to eat. I want you to look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 20 through 21. They, they, they wondered what they were going to eat. And here's what the Word of God says. If ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessings upon you the sixth year, and I shall bring forth fruit for three years. Did you hear that? God said, I want you to rest from doing work on this land. But how are we going to eat? How are we going to eat if we don't bring in nothing? God said, I got you. Somebody shout, say, God got you. God's got you. The Lord of the harvest had only to speak, and the needs were abundantly met. Somebody shout, glory. Man, all he had to do was speak, and it was met. Come on. No matter what you do, how much you try to toil and struggle, you can never do what God's going to do for you. Ah, glory to God. The same is true for every believer today. The same is true for you at home, those of you who are listening to me. The same is true for you. God need only to speak a word. Somebody say, I need a word from the Lord. I need a word. Listen, it don't make any difference how good somebody else is. It don't make no difference what anybody else has. It makes no difference about any of that. When God speaks a word over your life, it's going to come to pass. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. I, I, was, I was looking at this uh, Marcus Allen story. And Marcus... Became, when he became a tailback at, at USC, he, he got to college on a quarterback scholarship. He, his best position, he felt, was defensive back, and he thought he was going to be playing with the greats. All of those defensive backs that he played with, all of them made the Hall of Fame. He thought he was going to be a part of that great cadre of, of, defensive, uh, of, of you know, defensive backs, and uh, it never happened. But, but when he became a running back, he said something happened that was spectacular on one play. I forgot what, what game it was. He said, but he got the ball. When he got the ball, he said, and he cut around the end. He said it, he spun and done some stuff. And then he said, all of a sudden, everything slowed down. Good athletes sometimes, when they're inspired by God, can see it happen. Everybody else is all over the place. And, you know, everything happens in a split second. But if it slows down in slow motion, you can see pretty much where everybody is. Huh? And when everything slows down, you are like five and six and seven, like a master chess player. You are ten steps ahead of the next move. And he said when he jumped, one time it was Ronnie Lott, Lott who was his old teammate at USC. Ronnie Lott, they were playing Ronnie Lott's team in the pros. And he said he cut around the end, and Ronnie said, man, I had him lined up. He said, I know he didn't see me, but that was one of those times he cut the end, and he said everything went in slow motion. 
And Ronnie came, and when he, as soon as Ronnie came, he put his foot in the ground and he spun and went the other way. And after the game, Ronnie Lott said, you didn't see me. How in the world did you get away? He said, I saw you. God will come on here. God will slow it down. God will speed it up. God will do all he need to do is speak a word. If the word is the end zone, anything else between you and the end zone, it don't matter. You know what I'm saying? If the word is victory, anything between you and victory, it don't matter. Come on now. It's just a process. Come on now. Y'all need to give God some praise up in here. When God speaks a word, the lost year is going to be restored. This is how God restores our wasted years. He brings forth, brings us forth in supernatural, supernatural joy, revelation, peace, and victory. Far beyond human ability. That's how he does it. He will do it way beyond what you can imagine. He can accomplish more in us, for us, through us now than we could possibly try to do it ourselves. Did you hear me what I'm saying? We can stand upon righteousness. We, we can stand up right today and say, you know what, God? Yes, that's behind me. And I'm looking forward. Amen. If you like you've never sinned before, that's why I like the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul said, I wrong no man. Come on, if you can get to the place where you know you was a messed up person. But when they come and talk about, see, that's one thing about the family, I mean, not the family reunion. That's one thing about the high school reunions. Everybody got a story to tell your mate about your wickedness. So if you're going, you better have some thick skin because they come in with the stories of your wickedness. And when they're talking, you and your mate should be like Paul. We don't know Saul. We know not that man you're talking about. Huh? And, and, then, and, then, and then your countenance is so different. Come on here. God puts us right back on his divine schedule. His eternal purpose and plans are right where he planned for them to be for your life. You thought you was behind a step. You thought you were going to lose. You thought, haven't you ever seen it? Hmm? Have you ever seen somebody, parent, just, just a little simple example. I've seen it happen at the school a lot of times. Parent decides, you know, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep uh, Susie back. I'm gonna keep her back. She, she's not gonna go to the next grade. And when you keep them back, they think they're gonna lose everything. But by keeping them back, they learn the maturity that they need to learn. Hmm? There's some, there's some people, you know, they not, you know, they're going to school online, and somebody, has to, well, you know, they you. That's not college. You're going, you stand at your mama's house. You know, some, you know what? Uh, if, uh, what does a, what does a caterpillar become? See, he's a destructive little fella before he becomes a butterfly. <laughs> he's a destructive little fella. And, 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 and quit touching your son like that. I don't know why she touched him right there, right, right, right on that, right, 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 right on that one right there. I'm just trying. <laughs> he was a destructive little fella. But mama said, you will become a butterfly. Yeah. Grasshopper. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, though? You keep them back, and then all of a sudden, the maturity level, the ability to comprehend Everything comes second nature to them. They couldn't see it at first because they couldn't see the hand of God. See, we look at our schedule as man's schedule, but man's schedule is not God's schedule. Watch this now. His eternal purpose and plan are right where he planned them to be. Somebody shout, nothing lost. Nothing Say it again, nothing lost. nothing lost. 
listen, listen, listen. There's a war going on in the Ukraine, and people think, man, my life, this and that. Huh? Somebody shout, nothing lost. Nothing lost, nothing lost. I, I, I mean, my, this, my, this was my golden years. Somebody, no, no, say, say, somebody shout, nothing lost. See, here's what you got to understand. God lives, we live in time, but God lives in eternity. Did you understand that? Yet he doesn't make it up. He doesn't make it all up with outpourings alone. These outpourings become overflowings. Did you hear me what I'm saying? He just don't make it up with pouring it out. Remember we talked about the salsa on Wednesday. Yes, Lord Jesus. The cup is great, but that salsa, Lord have mercy. That's the overflow piece right there. Huh? That's the piece of overflow. Look at Joel 2 and 24. It says, and the floor shall be filled or full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout glory. Listen, at one moment, here comes the canker worm. Here comes the palmer worm. Here comes all of these things, the locusts coming after your stuff. Here comes the enemy talking about you. Here comes this injury to yourself. I got hurt. I'm out. I'm this. I'm that. Things happen. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, my floor is full with wheat. Uh, uh, my vats are full with wine and oil. Glory to God. In this time right now, I just got something from somebody at home says, is this really true happening in Germany? I think in Hamburg, 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 I think, up near Hamburg, they decided in public places and spaces that they were no longer going to use hot water. Well, that's all the time in Germany. You can go to the bathroom, you know. I'm thinking like, I hope these cooks back here don't have to come into this bathroom because there ain't no hot water in here. Y'all, y'all. You ever been to the bathroom where it was only one faucet? We've been doing that forever, so that ain't nothing new. I told the person, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, that's real true. Yeah, yeah, well, we, you know, well, we just cut off the hot water and hot water has to go down, you know, you just don't. So we got to use more hand sanitizers, you know, because the hot water is going to go off. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to have. But what if your vat was filled with oil? Huh? Huh? You know, I, I'm, uh, uh, I ain't going to say it. What if you, what if you, what if you, how many of y'all got oil in your house? Heat with oil. What if you filled up your oil tank two years ago and you had extra oil tanks? And you bought that oil for little or nothing. This is what the scripture is saying. And your oil vat is filled. Everybody else walking around in sweaters and freezing. And people want to know, why are warm in here, man? You got a little bit too hot, aren't you? You use all your oil? Baby, my vats are full. In fact, they're overflowing. Y'all want, maybe I'm trying to explain how that can be. How could that be? I'm going to have to do it in a criminal sense. Y'all can understand criminality. Some of y'all don't get cable, but you get cable from your neighbor. <laughs> y'all don't, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. See, y'all, y'all trying to act like y'all understand criminality. The kids don't understand nothing about that because they lived in a proper home and, 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 and Netflix and parents bought it. And the, and the parents bought it. Uh-uh, but, but when we was coming up, there was wires running from house to house. <laughs> Underground wires. What, we're like, hey, what is that wire for? Shut up! <laughs> Folks stealing people's cable. Come on. Y'all don't know nothing about that? <laughs> God's going to hook up a wire from heaven. Y'all didn't hear me. He's going to hook up a wire from heaven, and everybody going to be without, and you're going to be with. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. Somebody shout glory. There is such power in repentance. Somebody shout repent. It brings us back. He brings back to us everything that that canker worm destroyed. 
God's going to resurrect it all. Every bit of it is going to be resurrected. I'm almost finished. I need just a few more seconds. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. As I, as I was thinking about this, I think about Paul and I think about his life and I think about he was once Saul. You can put it back up. Brothering. He said, I count not myself to have apprehended. He says, listen, I, I, don't, I don't think that I, you know, did everything that I was supposed to do and do everything. With him, but this one thing I do, he said, I forget those things which are behind me. God, I forget the things that are behind me. And I reach forward unto those things which are before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, forget your past and press on in Jesus. Did you hear me? I said, forget your past and press on in Jesus. Satan's favorite harassment is to bring up your past and pull out old skeleton and old people to remember your past. Hmm? Come on now. And they show up at times where you're thinking like, out of all the times you're going to come, you're going to come today. They'll come up on a high moment. They'll come up on a time of celebration for you. They'll do everything they can to get you to go backwards. He will try to persuade you that an old addiction, an old lust is going to raise up again. It's going to take you down and devour you. That you're going to go back to an old temptation. Are you going to succumb to pride? Are you going to... Do something crazy and thinking that you can't fall, but then you would be targeted by the enemy for sure. But if you do the right thing, who is he that can harm you? Saints of God, as I get ready to wrap it up here, you might feel the bangs of remorse, a wasted time, wasted life. Some people say, well, God, why did you do this to me? Why did this happen to me? Do you know God could be keeping you from something? We want so bad. God, why didn't you do this for me? Why didn't you do that for me? Why didn't I get that? They got that. Hold up here. They got what they got. I got something for you. We always want to eat off somebody else's plate. Have you ever noticed that? We always want to live somebody else's life. Touch your neighbor and say, live your own life. Don't tell that to your mama. That wouldn't be good. Don't, say, don't tell your mama, daddy, that. Y'all should be sitting next to your mama and daddy right there. Don't tell them, live your own life. They're going to live your life and their life. You can trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is the situation hopeless? Can the Lord not cure our nation's wounds? He did so for, for Israel, you know, to America and all, uh, and all nations. God says, in like Jeremiah 31 and 3, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Mm -hmm. He said, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. To the wicked Israel. 
in Jeremiah 30 and 11, the Lord said, I will not make a full end of thee. He said, I won't make a full end of thee. But in the B part, I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Israel suffered an incredible womb of sin, an incurable, I want to say, womb of sin. But there remained a people in Israel who engaged their heart to God and approached God. Look at 30, Jeremiah 30 and 21. To these people, he said, he said, he said, I will cause them to draw near. He said, I shall cause them to draw near. Did you see that? And these nobles shall be of themselves and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near. God will call a remnant. I'm telling you, church, we talked about this during our time of prayer. We kept saying, listen, guys, there's going to be a remnant. He restored it. He built it, the city, on its own heap. He multiplied the blessed, and he blessed them. And in verse 20 of Jeremiah 20, 30 and 20, and he says, and the children also shall be aforetime. Agape concerning America is what the word said about Israel. The womb is incurable. But God could restore America the same way he restored Israel. He could heal the wasted years if he had people engaged in seeking him. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. And what? Turn from their wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven. He said, I will heal their land. He could wipe out all the years of wickedness, and he could restore and rebuild. God said, In 31 and 11 of Jeremiah, he said, ransom Israel. He said, redeem Jacob. Talking about Israel. And ransom him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Do you know that the sin and the, uh, the debauchery, the things that are happening in America every single day, what, did you see what's going on in, in, in San Diego, what they found in the school systems? Just pornographic stuff. That's for, we are asleep at the switch. But all of this debauchery and all of this stuff, God's saying, I see it. But if I can get a people huh, that would come, I will expose it. Huh? I will expose it. When we got our situation right now is terribly troubling. You can hide your face in the sand all you want to. We're in trouble. Hmm? We're in trouble. We're in trouble. It used to be that we could count on never being attacked and never being because we had a strong, oh, no, we so woke weak. And sensitive, we can't fight nobody. We can't fight nobody. Say we might offend them. We can't even do a ballistic missile test because we afraid we might offend our enemy. What kind of foolishness is this? You know, 
we, we delayed a test because we didn't want to offend Russia. Now we delayed another test, same one, because now we don't want to offend China. We're living in a time, y'all, where you should be concerned. But I'm telling you what, my concern is this remnant that's coming. If we can pull this remnant together, God's going to hear from heaven. You didn't hear me. Somebody shout, there's still hope. Somebody say, there's still hope. I believe that there is still hope. Time has not run out yet. Somebody say, there's still time on the clock. See, you don't hit very many 75-foot shots, you know, inbound, throw it up there, and it goes in. I mean, but it could go in, but it won't go in unless you what? You got to take it. Somebody got to throw it up there. Somebody got to throw it down there. Y'all didn't hear me. Somebody's got to throw it down there. Pray that God will draw himself to us and that that he would cause us to pray and that our nation would be spared. (laughs) That's not only America, that's every nation. Are you being devoured even now by the worms of the devil in your life? Think about it. What's going on in your life? You can start over again, but the first thing you got to do is repent. Somebody shout, repent. Yeah. And your wasted time can end now. Your past can be wiped clean. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Nobody wants to. You, when you read your own past, you don't even know that's you. The things that you were capable of, and the things that you did, and the things that you do. God's been so gracious. You know, we see a picture of of, of such restoration in the New Testament when Jesus heals the man with the withered hand. The Bible says that he told the man to stretch his hand out. He says, stretch forth, and he stretched it forth, and he says, and it was restored whole like as the other. What does restoration mean? Restoration means it was once okay. Y'all didn't hear me. It was once okay, but God restored it. I believe, saints of God, God's going to take those old wounds, those worries, those nagging heartaches, those things that have been bothering you, that have taken away from you, that put stress on your life, that's told your health to be bad. I guarantee you in your latter days are going to be better than the former. Yo, yo, I mean, you're, you're thinking, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to take care of this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But Somebody say, but God. God. Let God restore to you every year that was taken from you, your youth. Somebody said, well, I gave him my best years. I gave her my best years. Oh, come on. Shout out. Say, God God said, oh, no, not you. Your best years are yet to come. Yeah, my best years are ahead of me. My best years are ahead of my pain. My best years are ahead of my failures. My best years, come on now, my best years are ahead of every heartache that, come on, every tear that I ever cried, every time I could not go to sleep. My best years, every failure, every time I got fired, come on, every time I went back to the crack I said I was not going to do no more. Every time I lusted when I said I wasn't going to do it no more. God, I'm I'm way past that. God, I thank you. Then I'm going to press toward the prize. Oh, good God of mighty. There's a prize waiting for those that are willing to repent. Do I have anybody that want to repent this morning? I'm talking about wherever you are at home, I'm telling you right now, if you would just repent, we don't talk about repentance no more. We we, we go to these woke churches, but we don't even talk about sin. The wages of sin, but the gift of God is eternal life. God, I pray that you would cleanse me of my sin. 
God, I repent. I repent. I give my heart to you, God, because you deserve it. Restore me, God. Restore the joy of my salvation. Somebody's about ready to give up. Don't you quit. Don't you stop. Don't you quit. Come on. Don't you quit this morning. You, 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 you're ready to throw up both hands and holler. Don't you quit. Don't, 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 don't quit. God loves you. I know it's been difficult. And guess what? It's going to maybe even get harder. But I guarantee you one thing. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Hey, listen, 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 listen. It may get cold. They said, man, we're not going to have oil this winter in Germany. I'm going to make a prediction. My prediction is it's not going to be as cold as you think it's going to be. I got this feeling I'm going to be playing golf in November in Germany. Y'all didn't hear me. Don't let me get a December tea off time. Y'all didn't hear me. Uh, January, February. Don't let me be teeing off in January. You know what that means? Bishop Neal don't play in the cold. Y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm going to play their little stupid game. Climate change. God changed the climate. Because these, these boys acting stupid with the oil. Would you change it just for, change it for the saints? Y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. Huh? I hate cold. I hate cold. God is good, isn't he? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you want to come to the altar, those of you here that are at home before you leave me, I want to say to you, I want you to be a part of this altar call. I'm going to pray with you as well. But I want you to find a place where you can pray. But everybody that would come to this altar, listen, listen, this is a time of repentance. This is a time of turning. It's a time to saying, God, I need you now more than ever before. Yep, find your place. You can find a place anywhere. Your altar can be at your seat. Your altar can be here. Get on your knees. Get before the Lord. I see you coming. But I thank God for you. Those that you that are at home, listen, don't be, don't be ashamed. Because right now is the time of repentance. God's going to restore. I, somebody say just a word, one word. All we need is a word from God, and it changes everything. How will we eat? Don't worry. I got you. Don't worry. How are we going to heat it? Don't worry about it. I got you. I'm going to blow a warm wind in the middle of the cold. Y'all didn't hear me what I'm saying. I'm going to bring you a cup of water in the midst of the desert. Not only a cup, it's going to have ice in it. Come on. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, first of all, for those that are joining us from wherever they are around the world. I pray, God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, Father, that they would re that you would restore to them. Father, they've been angry with you, mad with you, and, and, and self-righteous and sometimes about what they've done and how they've done this and done that. But God, you don't, that's not what moves you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those saints that will just love you and be content in their life with whatever the lot is with you. Saying, God, I, I, I'm going to praise you no matter what my situation is. God, I pray by the power of your spirit that you would redeem, restore, God, those things that have been lost in the life of the believer. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray, God, for America, and I pray by the power of your spirit that a, that a remnant would show up. I pray for the nation of Germany that a remnant would show up and pray for this nation and move it toward God. Father, I pray, God, for every nation every, that, uh, that have believers, that the believers would be that remnant. Father, that would hear a word from heaven to make a difference. Father, we thank you. God, we give you praise. I believe, God, if my people who are called by my name, I believe that scripture will humble themselves and pray. Hmm? Seek from their faith and repent. Turn from their wicked ways. Then you will hear from heaven. God, I, I, I lay before you now and say, God, forgive me. Father, I pray that you keep me. God, keep me going in the right direction. Father, I thank you and I love you. Those that are here at this altar even now. We pray, God, by your spirit, God, we pray for whatever they need at this altar. Hands are raised.
tears are flowing. Hands, hearts are open toward you. And they're saying, God, whatever my lot, Father, I just need to hear a word from you to know that I'm going to make it through this terrible situation that I'm in. Father, I've made a mess of it. No one else but me. It was my decisions. It was my turn. But Father, I pray by your spirit that you would help me, deliver me. Let me know that I'm going to be okay. Father, we just thank you. We give you praise. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Those of you, before you leave me, listen, uh, if you are not, if you are not a part of a Bible-believing church and you need to be a part of a church, listen, contact us. Maybe we can help you to get to a church in your area. Maybe we can help you to get to some place that you need to be. We'd like to do that. But if you're in this local area, come on and be a part of Agape. Those of you who are looking to sow into the kingdom of God, God has burdened your heart to say, you know what? You need to get this hollow thing out of your house. Listen, Agape, and we've been at it for many, many years, 27 to be exact, and we continue to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. Matter of fact, our missionaries are in Ukraine as I speak now, heading on the way. They'll get there late tonight. We want to keep them lifted up in prayer. We'll pray for them before we leave tonight to this afternoon. But I want you to know that they need support and help, and, and every little bit helps, and we thank you all so much for that. Listen. We, if you're part of a Bible-believing church somewhere else, you don't give your tithes here. We don't want that, okay? We want you to give that tithe to wherever. I don't want you to be so emotionally driven that you like our ministry. To do. No, 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 no. Only those that are committed to this ministry. Listen, we love you. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Thank you so much for joining. Give them a big hand for joining us this morning.